let us start because we got a it's a pretty uh, hefty topic. Uh, this is uh, September 7, week 6. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm your host, Dr. Garayas. This is MED 110, Anatomy and Physiology 1. Please check your emails. I sent uh, midterm items. Uh, majority of you did uh, rather well. And it also, it also shows that you could mess up my midterm or my final. But if you do everything that you're supposed to be doing during the weeks, you should be fine. Uh, there's some of you who scored like, I don't know, in the 60s and 70s and still got an A minus B plus out of it. So uh, please uh, keep up with your weekly items. Today, uh, task five, lesson five, and um, uh, discussion five are due. I'll grade them probably tomorrow. But what are we doing this week? It's cardiovascular. Now, it's, uh, this is a really nice topic. And also, we're going to be uh, dissecting a heart um, in the weeks to come. This is week six. Um, uh, during week eight, we're going to be dissecting a heart. Um, and the cardiovascular system, it's really, really important because look at the two major things that everyone always talks about. Everyone always talks about uh, hypertension and uh, always talking about um, blood pressure, hypertension, and uh, coronary artery disease. So knowing your anatomy and physiology of, uh, you know, chapter 19 of your heart and um, the blood vessels, is kind of important. Now, if you look at this, again, there's these lovely notes and they're really, they're, they're really quick and really easy, but the diagrams are horrendous. But I'll be showing you also uh, a way where you can look at the diagram a little bit easier. And I'll have that video available for you um, uh, when we talk about um, um, the cardiac cycle. So let's start, and uh, it's chapter 19 and chapter 20, but more 19 than 20. I could pretty much uh, summarize chapter 20 in, um, in five, 10 minutes, but it's chapter 19 is the, is the biggie. So we will go into our uh, textbook, which is OpenStax, chapter 19. Table of contents. And here you go. So the heart. The heart's uh, really important. It's the center of your cardiovascular uh, system. It is about the size of your fist. It is located in your thoracic cavity, also known as your media steinum. And you can see here, this is your thorax. And let's make this a little bit bigger. This is your thorax. And within it, you also have your, uh, your two lungs and, of course, your heart. Now, let's look at some of these uh, great blood vessels. Now, if you see tubing that's colored blue, it's not colored blue in real life. But for our purposes, it's, it's what they call in anatomy and physiology a convention. So mean, meaning to say is... It's, it's a signal of what the structure that they're talking about. So if, and your exam will be of course in uh, color because uh, you're gonna need to identify certain things. And if I point at this thing, which is the superior vena cava going into your right atrium right here, um, it's colored blue. And it's colored blue because uh, it is the majority of the red blood cells that are running through this tube are deoxygenated. Meaning to say is, the majority of the gas that the red blood cell is carrying in this blue tube is carbon dioxide, which is our waste product. And if, it's, if the tube, like this aorta here, is, it's colored red, that means the majority of the red blood cells are carrying oxygen. So that's one big question. If something's oxygenated, like this aorta, or deoxygenated, like this superior vena cava. You will also notice here on this picture as well, there's these little arteries and veins that surround the heart. They surround it like a crown, hence the term coronary blood vessels. There's coronaries, arteries, and veins. And that's where you get the heart attack. And we're going to talk about that momentarily. 
You have the base of the heart, which is uh, right here, where all the great vessels go in and out. And then you have the pointy part, which is the apex. The apex lies around somewhere around your fifth intercostal space, uh, midclavicular line. So there's spaces here. So there's one, two, three, four, five, and your clavicles here, and it matches right around here. Also known as your PMI or point of maximal impulse. That is your apex of the heart. And you could kind of feel the apex of your heart. If everyone could put their hand uh, on their left side of their chest, and that's where you could also see the majority of the heart lies. And the majority of it lies on the left side of the chest, unless you know you have something like dextrocardia, which it, it's on the wrong side, which is on the right side. Now you could see here, this is right lung, left lung, and the heart's a little bit more. If you if we put like an imaginary mid, mid line right here, the majority of the heart is here on the left side. And like I stated, if you feel your heart right now. The point at which the point of maximal impulse or the point where you kind of really feel the heartbeat the most should be around here. So that's where your heart is. It's in your mediastinum, also known, I guess, which is this middle section of your thorax, which is your, um, you, know, you know, your chest cavity. And it borders down here. This is your diaphragm. And of course, your right lung, left lung. Do, 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 do. Size, shape of the heart. Let's look at. Now we're going to be talking about if you just look at it like this and just try to memorize it like I used to do uh, when I was sitting in your seat. Um, that's not a good idea. We're going to show you something called the um, the, uh, the box diagram, uh, which will go, uh, which will pretty much trace um, a single drop of blood from the left atrium all throughout the system. Now, right off the bat, if you notice the heart, everything on, it looks like the majority of the tubing and these rooms here, they're, they're called uh, ventricles. So you have your, um, the big room here, which is a ventricle, a big room here is another ventricle. And the little rooms on top or chambers will be your atria. So you have your left atrium here and uh, right atrium here, right ventricle here, left ventricle here. Um, you'll notice that everything on the left side is mostly colored red. And that's your systemic circulation. And your systemic circulation is usually on the left side. And it is not usually, it is on the left side. And it's of course, uh, oxygenated blood that's gonna go uh, right out here through your aorta and through the rest of your body. Hence the term systemic circulation. And this is like a continuation of the aorta down here. And that's your descending aorta that will go down to your uh, abdominal cavity. Now you have, of course, we talked about the superior vena cava and you have your inferior vena cava and uh, that empties right into your uh, right atrium here. Now, right now you might be a little bit overwhelmed. There's so many arrows, so many things to do. But when I explain the box diagram, it's gonna get a little bit more, a little bit more simplified. So right off the bat, you have left-sided heart which is systemic circulation, mostly oxygenated. And then you have the right-sided heart, which is um, your pulmonary circulation, and it's mostly deoxygenated. And it makes sense. We're going to be talking about this momentarily, but everything on the left side is coming, I mean, on the right side, remember, this is the right side of your patient. This is the left side of your patient. Everything to the right side is venous, and it's coming back to the heart because it has to go into from the heart to the lungs to get more oxygen. And then when it, once it comes back from the lungs, it has all this oxygen. And then you have your left-sided um, circulation that's going to pump it all the way back out into the systemic, which is the rest of the systems. So again, to recap, left-sided, systemic, right-sided, pulmonic or pulmonary, um, red means oxygenated, blue means deoxygenated. And um, right off the bat, you'll see that most arteries, like the aorta, run away from your heart and are typically oxygenated. And most veins go back to your heart and they're typically deoxygenated. But there is an exception to the rule, and you can see uh, an exception here and here. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about the box diagram momentarily. So I could ask you, left-sided circulation, 
systemic. Right-sided circulation, pulmonic or pulmonary. Oh, by the way, even though the heart and lungs, we're discussing them separately, if there's a problem with your lungs, don't you think all this pressure from your lungs can back up into the right side of your heart and then cause right-sided heart failure, also known as core pulmonale? Okay. And if you understand your anatomy and physiology, oh, if my right side of my heart's messed up, that means there might be a problem with my lungs because the right side of my heart is intimately connected to my lungs. Okay. Write down one more person. Good. Let's now look at the covering or the layers. Now, this is where your medical terminology powers come into play. You can sit and try to memorize all these, which one goes first, which one goes last, or you can use your medical terminology powers. So pericardium, peri, is the prefix that means surrounding or outside. So that's gotta be the tough layer on the very outside. That's your fibrous pericardium. Now, your pericardial layer is in two layers with a, um, um, uh, what do you call that? With a potential space in between it. So you have your parietal layer, which is a little bit more on the outside, and you have your visceral layer, which is more on the inside. And then you have this potential space in between. So we know that parietal is on the outside, visceral, viscera means guts, that means you're on the inside. And the space in between here has pericardial fluid in it, and the function of this space is for uh, lubrication because the heart is in this sac called your pericardium and it's moving and beating all the time. So you need the pericardial fluid and, um, and this potential space to decrease friction and also protect the heart. So that's your pericardium, the outside wall. Now the middle layer is your muscular layer known as your myocardium, that's the majority of it. And if you look at the endocardium, it's a very thin, delicate layer, and it's on the inside. And remember, we talked about that before. Everything on the outside is tough, like this fibrous pericardium. But once you get closer and more on the inside, then uh, it gets really delicate, and, and it, gets, it gets dangerous if it gets damaged. So, for example, if you had a heart attack that only affected these outer layers, then you're good. I release you in a couple of days. But if you have uh, subendocardial or endocardial damage, um, don't make any plans. You probably need a new heart. You're going to be in trouble, right? So whoever built us, built us pretty tough on the outside, but if the damage goes inside and more inside, and that's how you actually differentiate the different kinds of levels of heart attack or heart failure. And the heart attack is also known as your myocardial infarction, which we'll uh, talk about that momentarily. So know your layers. And we're also going to see this again when we do the dissection and use your medical terminology powers. Now, here's a classic um, emergency room question. Uh, cardiac tamponade, also known as pericardial tamponade. Now, sometimes, uh, let me give you a story so you can remember it a little bit better. And not really for the exam, but to also understand how, if you know your anatomy and physiology, with pathology will come easy. So we know I have a covering. I know I have a potential space. I also know that on the outside of my heart, I have arteries and veins. Now, what happens if I smash my rib cage or my chest really, really hard, uh, like on a steering wheel? I had a female truck driver. She was going a little bit faster than she should have. And then she got cut off and she ran herself into a telephone pole. And she, she had a blunt force trauma to her chest and her neck and then she got pericardial tamponade. The fluid blood started filling up this space. Now what happens if this gets all tight with blood? Can your heart pump anymore? No. So uh, she had a 30 pulse. Her blood pressure started what? Everything started squeezing. Blood pressure started going up. She started getting distended neck veins because guess what these tubes are connected to? the tubes in your neck as well. And it goes, uh, she was also cyanotic because she's not getting oxygen because the heart isn't pumping very well. So instead of me trying to memorize all of that that's going on here, 
if I know and understand how pericardial or cardiac tamponade works and how um, gumming up all these layers is going to squeeze on my heart and put pressure, right? Then I don't have to memorize all of this. You can pretty much figure stuff out, right? But it's typically from trauma, but it could be other things like pericarditis, inflammation, or infection of your pericardium, uh, myocardial rupture, you know, when your heart actually rips a little bit, uh, it happens. So let's look at these structures now, right off the bat. Do you think there are quizzes like this all over the place? All I have to do is quiz anatomy, heart, external. Do you think I should go home tonight and do what? Do this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then practice that for five, 10 minutes every day until your final or five, 10 minutes until, you know, until kingdom come. Yes, do that. Uh, and it'll, you'll get better and better at it because what are the odds of this and this coming out on the exam, on your final exam? Pretty darn good because this is what anatomy is all about, right? The parts and the external anatomy. And it's one of our goals for today. So let's look at this heart. First, how do you know that it's front and back? And um, you know it because if you look at this diagram, the atria, here's your right one, here's your left one, it's more on the front. If I look at the back one, the, uh, the rear view or posterior view, I don't see your atria or the smaller rooms or the smaller chambers. Now, if this is the atria, this is the right one, this is the left one, then these have to be ventricles. And if this is the right one, this has to be the right ventricle. And this is the left atrium, this has to be the left ventricle. All of these are coronary arteries. Uh, you'll know this one as uh, anterior cardiac vein and, and, and the ACA, anterior cardiac artery. You have your left coronary artery, also known as your LAD, left anterior descending, with a great cardiac vein. This is the main uh, notch or sulcus, right? And it's called the anterior interventricular sulcus, S-U-L-C-U-S, or um, like, a, like a ridge or an, um, like a groove. That's the best way to put it. So in these grooves lie arteries and veins. What kind of arteries and veins? Your coronary artery and veins, because your coronary arteries and veins surround your heart like a crown, okay? So, but the big one here is your um, uh, left coronary artery leading into your left anterior descending. And I mentioned that because number one, it's the landmark that you're gonna be able to separate left ventricle from right ventricle. And it's also the number one place where um, um, a blood clot or a piece of fat or, a, uh, um, or you can get a infarction or a blockage. And that's called a myocardial infarction. About 78% of MIs or AMIs, um, which is acute myocardial infarction. That means you get a heart attack like really, really fast, like, you know. Um, so an AMI or acute myocardial infarction typically will happen around this area in your left anterior descending. And it makes sense. It's on the left side of the heart. It's in the front side of the heart and it's going down, down from your LCA, which is your left coronary artery. Then you have your circumflex. Circum means to go around. So that means it's going this way. Okay. <clears throat> so I could ask you, which one's the ventricles? I could ask you any one of these, that's easy piece. Now, when you're looking at the great veins, we already seen the superior vena cava. And if I have a superior vena cava, I have an inferior vena cava. I could also ask you, is this oxygenated or deoxygenated? And you'll tell me, deoxygenate, because it's colored blue. This is your aorta or aortic arch, and it's colored red. Therefore, this is oxygenated. You have your left pulmonary veins and your right pulmonary veins. And those are deoxygenated. I mean, those are oxygenated. And that's one of the exceptions. Your pulmonary veins are the exceptions to the rule that arteries are typically, um, 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 uh, what do you call that? The veins are typically deoxygenated. Your pulmonary uh, system is backwards. So 
right pulmonary arteries and veins, left pulmonary, I mean, left pulmonary vein and right pulmonary vein are oxygenated, as you can see here. Now your left pulmonary artery coming right off of here, right off your right ventricle. And that's going to my, of course, my lungs, since the, hence the term left pulmonary artery, that is deoxygenated right here. So those are the parts. And of course, great vessels. This is the base. This is your apex. Those are all the salient features of your anterior view, external structures of the heart. Now, when you're looking, one of the main things you have to know, note about when you're looking at anatomy and physiology is um, orientation. So remember, when I'm looking at the front, this is the left and this is the right. But when I'm looking at the back, this is now the left and now this is the right, okay? Now, what are the big, big features on the posterior portion? Of course, you need to know your uh, great vessels here. You have your left atrium here, and of course, in this area here would be your uh, left ventricle. In this area here would be your right ventricle. Here in your posterior interventricular sulcus, you have your posterior interventricular artery and your middle cardiac vein. Your middle cardiac vein empties out into this huge venous structure here, which is your coronary sinus. And that's also another way how you know you're in the back. Your coronary sinus is present and your posterior interventricular sulcus is going straight down and heading right towards the apex, okay? All the other structures, you know, uh, we went over it before, but now it's what? Backwards. This is the right, I mean, this is the left side and this is the right side. And when you're looking at the anterior view, this is the left side and this is the right side. The two, 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 two internal structures of the heart. Let's look at this. Don't you think this would be a nice picture as well? It would be a lovely picture. Of course, well, let's get our bearing. It's anterior, we're looking at it. I think we have a question. No, we don't. So we're looking at this, right? And um, we have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, did I get everybody? More people a minute ago. Okay, I got you, I got all of you. There's six, one, two, three, four, five, six. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and me. Good. So let's look at this. This is the internal structures and it's anterior. So if I'm looking at anterior, I know this is the left side and this is the right side. So I got to get my bearing. I know the little rooms or little chambers are called atria. So this has to be the left atrium. This has to be the right atrium. And if this is the left atrium. This has to be the left ventricle. And this is if this is the right atrium, this has to be the right ventricle. Right, so you should be good. That's already, you got that down. Now you also have your interventricular septum. Inter means between, between what? The two ventricles. And a septum is just something that separates left from right. Now the great vessels, of course, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, both empty into your right atrium. You have your um, left pulmonary artery, which exit your right ventricle, and it goes through a set of valves. This valve is called your pulmonic semilunar valve, also known as just simply your pulmonary valve. And this little valve here, which you've got to use your imagination, is going to go underneath here and into the aorta. It's obviously going to be called your aortic semilunar valve because it's going from here, your left ventricle, into your aorta. Now, you also have two AV valves here. You have uh, an AV valve is an atrioventricular valve. And the one on the left is called your mitral valve, also known as a bicuspid. And this is how I remember. Bi means two, and there's two names for it. And you see these two little bumps here? That's gotta be two, bicuspid. Now, one, two, three little bumps over here, that's gotta be your tricuspid, and that's on the right side. Now, you know when your heart makes sounds like lub dub, lub dub? Those sounds are the opening, I mean, not opening, but the closing of these valves. Okay, and if you have something that goes wrong, then you're going to hear it. And that's why we do a lot of auscultation in uh, cardiology. 
and auscultation is when we take the stethoscope and we listen to both the front side and the back side of your chest. So those are your AV valves. Now, if you look at, there's a big difference between your atria and ventricles. You see how thin the atria are and smooth? It's because they're low pressure. But the ventricles, you see how thick they are? Look how thick this is. And they also have this stuff called trabeculae carne, which means um, trabeculations are just branches. Carnie or carne, potato, potato, um, means meat. So it's got a lot of meat to it. It's, it's really uh, thick. And it makes sense because the ventricles are high pressure. And that low pressure and high pressure, maybe you remember it as systolic and diastolic when you're talking about blood pressures. The systolic is the bigger uh, number, right? And that deals with the pressures of your ventricles. And your diastolic deals with the pressures of uh, your um, atria. So you could see, you could see it physiologically that again, form has to fit function. Now, if we're looking more at these structures here on the inside, let's look at this AV valve on the right side, and that's your tricuspid. There are three uh, papillary muscles here, and they're connected to these cords called chordae tendinae. And it makes sense because a tendon connects to a muscle. And then it's connected to your actual tricuspid valve. Now here on the left side, you have two of them, two papillary muscles, and papilla looks like and actually means finger-like. So these finger-like projections or these papillary muscles can pull on these chordae tendinae and it opens and closes this mitral valve, also known as your bicuspid valve. So those are the interior structures of your heart, okay? And if you could also see here, your uh, pulmonary veins, they're oxygenated, they're, they connect here into your left atrium. And there's more holes here on the other side, but you gotta use your imagination a little bit. Okay, so if you're gonna study anything tonight, hit this up, hit this, hit this, start learning them now. Um, you know what, I'll say it. It's guaranteed that one of those three structures will be on your uh, final exam. And remember your final exam is cumulative. Um, it will be week five, week six, week seven, week eight, or was, was it week, no, it'll be week six, week seven, week eight, week nine material, six through nine. Now let's, and all this is uh, this thing in real life, you could see the papillary muscles and you could see the chordae tendine and it's connected to the valve itself. Here's a top view of your semilunar valves, and that's what they're called. Uh, well, 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 this will top view of this. Top view of your semilunar valves. You got to use your imagination a little bit. If you look at it sideways, it looks like a crescent. Uh, that's why they call it semilunar valve. And um, if you could use your imagination regarding your tricuspid and bicuspid. It's, um, uh, what do you call it? It's like kind of like a reverse parachute. And I'll show you more about that when, uh, when we're in laboratory. Oh, here it is. See how it's like a kind of like a parachute. So when blood falls through here, right? It kind of captures it all. And then when the papillary muscles right here pull on it, it pulls on the rope and then the blood falls down via gravity. And remember, when the valves open, when the valves close, it makes a sound. Hence, your heart sounds. And if something's abnormal, like a broken valve or, or some uh, endocardial damage, like let's say a really bad heart attack, it's going to start sounding funny. Of course, cardiologist, cardiology tech, uh, coronary arteries. We talked a little bit about them and uh, you should be able to identify them. And again, all the coronary arteries, especially our arterial ones, they connect into the uh, ascending aorta and it makes sense. Your ascending aorta is uh, oxygenated. So you're gonna want to bring that oxygenation back to the heart. Now, these blood vessels are um, exaggerated. 
in real life, they are much, much thinner than that. In real life, they're as thin as this. So you can only imagine that it doesn't take a lot of fatty plaque to cover to to block this. It doesn't take much of a, of a blood clot to block this. So that's why we we pay close attention um, to um, you know how thick and how viscous my patient's blood is, and we also pay attention to um, how many platelets they have. If any of you know anyone who's has um, See, and here's a classic right here. Left coronary artery, but you can see here. And this is called an angiogram. Okay, and then uh, sometimes we, we put this, um, we give you this, uh, this chemical called contrast and you can see ooh, the blockage of uh, the circumflex artery. And if you remember your anatomy a minute ago, um, it looks like left ventricular problem. Because remember, the circumflex goes to the left. And the most likely culprit is left, uh, 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 a left sided problems. But again, you could also have right sided problems as well. Now, what makes a heart muscle cell so special? Number one, it's automated, it has an auto rhythmicity, meaning to say is, you leave it alone and you, you, you pump it full of electricity, it's gonna start pumping. But the neat thing is because of these intercalated discs and these gap junctions, they glue it together and they form something called a syncytium. Now, what does that mean? It means if this is beating at 80 beats per minute alone, and this is beating at 90 beats per minute alone, when you put them together, they'll both start beating at, you know, somewhere in the middle, like 85 beats per minute. And that's what's neat about the, your heart. Normally, it all beats and controls itself rhythmically and regularly. That's why we are always paying attention to not only how fast or how slow your heart is, what is the rhythm? Is there a normal rhythmicity? Lub-dub, 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 or is it irregular? Hmm. Conduction system of the heart. Now, all your heart is, is a, um, is a muscle. And all a muscle does is contract, but then get smaller. So it begs the, it, it begs the question, then how does it pump? How does it keep its rhythmicity? How it goes, how does it know? Well, your brain is connected to these nodes that, that are here located in your right atrium. These nodes are just simply bundles of uh, nervous fiber and it's colored yellow because remember, yellow means fat, right? And fat um, nerves are um, surrounded by fat and you'll go, we'll go over that in your anatomy and physiology two class when we discuss uh, the nervous system because it's a good insulation for this wiring. So your SA node is called the pacemaker of your heart. And the AV node are called your brakes, like, like, like brakes as in B-R-A-K-E-S, -E you know, like the brakes on your car. So your SA node pumps around, I mean, um, tells your heart, hey, we want to go about 100 beats per minute, give or take. But in order for the blood to fill this atria and then to go down, it's going to take some time. So you got to slow down that beats, those beats. So who does that? And that's your AV node. Those are the brakes. Both of them are located in your right atrium. After the AV node, it goes to your uh, uh, bundle of Hiss, which is right here. And then from the bundle of Hiss, the action potential or the electricity then travels into your right and left bundle branch and to the sides and Purkinje fibers. Now, I'm gonna show you an illustration, a little uh, thing, and you'll see how EKGs make sense. And uh, what are the uh, conductions? This is my favorite video. I use this in like three different classes. I teach symbology. It's a piece of a very old puzzle buried within the capital. Put that. Okay, 
The cardiac conduction system consists of the What's going on? Why can't I hear anything? Okay, that's on. Following components. All right, right now, I'll just be the voice, I guess. So it starts off the SA node. Near the entrance of the superior vena cava. Right, then blood goes this in. This is the natural pacemaker Roof of the heart. Roof for deoxygenated. It initiates all heartbeat and determines heart rate. And it takes time rate. for that to happen. Electrical so impulses as the electricity from the SA, SA node spread SA node, throughout both the atria node, and, that and yellow stimulate is them to the contract. The action potential, also known as the, the atrioventricular node, that signals your AV node, uh, muscle or your heart, located on the other side of the right then atrium, goes to the AV node. near the AV valve. The AV node Skip. serves as electrical so gateway node here, to the ventricles. AV node here. It delays the passage of electrical. Then the SA node travels then and passes them onto the of atrioventricular his, bundle, AV also bundle, known as the AV bundle, branch. bundle of his. This bundle, the ventricular then it travels myocardium, down to your left and uh, right and left uh, bundle branches of the heart can into be recorded your, in the form now, of electrocardiogram into your, uh, into and your ventricles, the ventricular and that's where the Purkinje fibers are. They're on the end. Now, of all the action uh, you don't need to know this, but it's a nice and the segue the into understanding what an EKG is. Electrical signals so, spread throughout EKG the atria reads these and impulses, cause them to these depolarize. little bits of electricity. This is and it represented forms a wave. by the P and it wave makes on sense. the ECG. The little wave is the atria because I don't atrial have to pump contraction too much. It's low pressure, systole, but I got to pump a lot for the ventricles, so you can see that the, the QRS complex. The PQ and then I have to reset, the time the signals and that's your T wave. The SA nodes to the AV node. And if your the QRS EKG complex doesn't look the firing just like the this, AV node then there's a problem. Ventricular it's a problem with the P wave. Odds are it's Q an atrial problem. QRS, odds are it's a ventricular problem. Septum. T wave, you're probably having R -wave a heart attack. Is produced by depolarization uh, inverted T waves of the main mass are of the signs ventricles. of a heart attack. That means your heart is not S wave represents the last uh, phase of repolarizing problem. The so what does it look like all together? ventricular repolarization immediately before ventricular relaxation. Wait a the cycle repeats itself like with every heartbeat. Okay. So the recap, SA node, pacemaker. AV node, the brakes. Bundle of his, left and right bundle branches, then Purkinje fibers. You have your systolic circulation, that's your ventricles, that's under high pressure. Your diastolic, that's your atria, low pressure. Okay? And that's the worst I could do to you. And you could see now why some people need a pacemaker. We put wires in here and we connected this here and we connected it into a little box that we put in your chest. And you can see the cycle here. Boop, 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 boop. Starts at the top, moves its way down. Now, a rapid influx of calcium and sodium, that starts the um, action potential, also known as depolarization. Now, what does depolarization mean? Let's see what that means. To me, depolarization means doing work. Okay? Now, do you guys know? Here's, here's the best way to look at. Do you guys know like uh, what uh, what a nine volt battery looks like? Is this thing? Right. You ever mess with this? When you were a kid. You can put your tongue on one of these, the negative, nothing will happen. You put your tongue separately on this and nothing happens, right? That means the pluses and minuses of the, electric, of the electrical field are what? Polarized, meaning they're on separate poles. One's on the North Pole, one's on the South Pole. But what happens when you put your tongue on both of them, okay? You are now depolarizing. You are taking the two opposite poles, and D means no and not, and you're putting them together. And I always say depolarization, doing work. So when you have the pluses and minuses separate, there's no charge. But then you have, uh, remember these? 
from another lecture. Then you have these uh, protein channels that move sodium and uh, calcium in and out of the cell. So if the pluses and minuses start interacting with each other, then you have an action potential or you start having some electricity like here, right? And sodium and calcium are the instigators. They, um, they promote depolarization. They promote contraction of your heart. They promote depolarization. Now, repolarization, that's potassium. You can see that down here. That kills the shell. And that's actually your T wave uh, in your EKG. And what do you think we use? Potassium. What do you think we use to stop your heart permanently? Let's say you're on death row and you have lethal in injection. We use potassium iodide. So it pretty much signals your heart to do what? To uh, repolarize or separate the pluses and minuses. And then what do you got? You have no signal. No signal, the heart won't pump, and you die. That's simple. So if somebody has hyperkalemia or way too much potassium or even way too little potassium, that's going to signal a very, very bad heart problem. And you can see here, calcium, right? Rapid depolarization. The sodium starts to show. The calcium then continues it. But then when we want to um, repolarize or rest or recharge, then it's the potassium that does the show. So what could I ask? What gives contraction? Sodium starts it. Calcium continues it. What stops the contraction of the heart? Potassium. And there has to be a balance and there is a, has to be a timing of it. And that's what's important. And because why do you think we give calcium carbonate when my patient's, uh, uh, my patient's uh, heart isn't doing very well? Why do I give potassium a uh, potassium push if I want to slow slow the heart down. And, and remember, all of the stuff that you're learning is directly applicable to not only future pathology classes, but your future med surge stuff. Here's your defibrillator. This is the old school one. The new ones now are just, um, you know, stickers. Now, if remember, the heart must pump in an organized fashion. When it doesn't, that's when we get into a lot of trouble. Because think about it, if you don't pump in an organized fashion, you won't have a lot of, of volume leaving your heart and you need that oxygenated red blood cell because it has to go to the systemic, most of the systemic world and vice versa on the right side of the heart. If it's not pumping very well, like let's say, for example, in uh, core pulmonale or right-sided heart failure, do you think we can get the blood to the deoxygenated blood to the to the lungs where, where you can get, you know, uh, rejuvenated with more oxygen. No, we cannot. Now, everything has to deal with pressure. Everything always has to deal from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And where's the formula? I already talked about heart sounds. Mm. Oh, this, if anyone's going to medical school or taking the MCAT, this is on the MCAT big time. But for us, all you need to know is what makes the lub dub sound? Well, when the uh, um, AV valves close, that's the lub. When the semilunar valves close, that's the dub. So when you're listening to normal heart sounds, you should hear lub dub. Lub dub, lub dub. And love, of course, AV valves because they're first. Semilunar valves are second. And then you kind of, if you want to go to medical school, you're going to have to memorize all these pressures and be able to read this and know the difference between aortic pressure and ventricular pressure and atrial pressure and all that other jazz. But you can see here, it makes sense. Atrial pressure, look how low it is because it's a low pressure system. But you look at the ventricular, which is systolic, boom, a lot. And look what it makes sense, 120 over what? 80, and that's your typical uh, normal blood pressure in a 70 kilogram man. And if anything gets out of whack, like when you get older, your S3, this is called S1, S2, or the lub and your dub. Uh, when you get closer to my age and a little bit beyond, you know, around 60s, uh, it's normal to start hearing this one. 
uh, there's an extra one um, that you get when you get older. But you can see if there's something wrong with either one of my valves, I might get extra, extra sounds, okay? And if you know your anatomy, then you easily can find the placement of, for auscultation for certain murmurs. Aortic murmur will of course be up here because pulmonary will be over here, tricuspid here, mitral here. And you, you know that, that uh, those are the typical locations for your valves if you know your anatomy and physiology. Um, and again, uh, wanna take your medical college aptitude test, please come see me. You're gonna need to know the exact locations of all this as well. But you guys are usually NCLEX. NCLEX are more about, uh, you, well, you'll see, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of you. Now, why is this all important? Because I need for I need the volume of the blood coming out of my heart to be consistent. So it'll deliver to the rest of my body, including the lungs and, and including your systemic circulation. So heart rate multiplied by stroke volume equals cardiac output. Cardiac output is your typical, uh, typical measurement about the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle every 60 seconds or every one minute. And it depending on the heart rate and the stroke volume. So if your cardiac output falls, guess what we do regarding management? If you know this formula, I'm either gonna play with the stroke volume, I'm gonna make um, uh, more blood volume in my patient. I could put uh, some fresh, fresh frozen plasma or whole blood in my system. I could also uh, increase the drip for uh, fluids and heart rate. Don't you think I could mess? Uh, I could give uh, calcium or I could also give, um, uh, change your sodium grip, I, drip. I could do a whole bunch of crazy things and to affect the cardio, cardiac output. So you could see also other things that'll affect your heart rate, your age, fitness level, hormones, okay? So a lot of these uh, dudes and dudettes who are taking exogenous hormones, don't you think it's gonna mess with your heart rate? Yes, yes, sir, we Bob, it will. Uh, and your stroke volume, which is how much, uh, um, how much is, how much is the uh, ventricles putting out? Well, again, there's a whole bunch of things affecting that, but know this formula, heart rate times stroke volume equals cardiac output. And another thing we also mention, measure is ejection fraction, which is the portion of blood that's, uh, that's um, released upon each contraction. Uh, that too is also related to SV, which is stroke volume. Um, don't wanna get an exercise. Now, uh, normal heart rate is uh, 60 to 100 beats per minute, okay? So anything more than 100 is tachycardia. Anything less than 60 is bradycardia. And it's relative term, like for example, when I'm running regularly, my heart rate is at what, 58, 57? Does it mean I have bradycardia? No. Uh, or if I'm upset and I was running up and down the stairs and I have a, a um, uh, 120, 115 uh, BPM, does it mean I have tachycardia? No, right? Um, so typically we look at um, like the average of three different heart rates when the patient is in a quiet room sitting down on three consecutive days in three consecutive similar times. Like if we take the heart rate in the morning, uh, take it in the morning, every morning around the same time, same location, same atmosphere for, for three days, and that will give you your average. And that's just a little something from cardiology. If any of you would love to go there. Um, your autonomic nervous system, it's controlled by your cranial nerve 10. And that controls your heart because your heart is autonomic. You cannot control your heart. It will do what it needs to do. And if you look, your vagus nerve is parasympathetic. So it is what? It's going to decrease heart rate. Parasympathetic is feed or breed, decrease heart rate, decrease blood pressure. But your brainstem here also has a sympathetic nervous innervation, which will increase heart rate. So if we're talking about sympathetic nervous system, think increase of heart rate, parasympathetic decrease. 
When you have something that's the opposites and really close, memorize one like your life depended on it. I memorize sympathetic because that's fight or flight. When you're running away from a pit bull or fighting it, which is fight or flight, what's going to happen to your heart rate? Increase. What's going to happen to your blood pressure? Increase. And the exact opposite, parasympathetic, which is uh, mainly your vagus nerve, that's what? Decrease. And a lot of medications and therapies mess with this as well. Bainbridge, no, nah, I don't want to talk about that. You also some drugs like norepi, also known as adrenaline, proprioceptors. I'm not going to go with this. Catecholamines, which is epinephrine, norepinephrine. And if you're into like, you know, uh, smoking crack or doing any of those horrific drugs, that'll increase all of that as well. Uh, do I want to talk about that? No, no, no. Oh, thyroid. Your T3, T4, and your TSH. But mainly uh, uh, your T3, which is triiodothyronine, right? Your thyroid hormones control um, uh, metabolic activity, which is directly related to increased uh, cardiac rate and contractility. So thyroid hormones tend to increase stuff. So every time my patient has maybe uh, signs and symptoms of anxiety disorder, or um, they have an increased heart rate, or they feel nervous for no reason with no history of any um, uh, previous psychiatric or anxiety states, I'm going to look at their thyroid. Even, even if they had previous anxiety, I still look at their thyroid. Of course, we looked at calcium levels and we know why. Uh, we already talked about that. Caffeine and nicotine always increase that stuff because caffeine and nicotine, they are natural neurotransmitters in my system. And if you take exogenous forms of caffeine and nicotine, which I used to love, I was a coffee drinker for so many years and I was a smoker for about 12 years. Loved every minute of it. But the problem is didn't love me back. So, and also what kind of hypocrite would I be? What kind of, what kind of doctor slash teacher? I preach, oh, you should be good and uh, don't do this stuff. So I don't drink either anymore. Well, don't, don't drink caffeine anymore, nor do I smoke anymore. But it's every time I'm in the bar or whatever, it still smells so good. But you got to keep away from it. Because another thing that affects heart rate, which we already talked about, is, of course, stress and cortisol. So that's also another thing we also have to tell our patients that you got to get away from whatever stressors. I have a friend of mine who uh, he doesn't drive anymore because he road rages all day. So... He doesn't drive anymore because it, it bothers him. Um, and uh, he's the better man for it. And also he got court order to, you know, you can only imagine what kind of history that's about. So let's look at, let's look at our goals. Did we look at our, I think we, let's look at our goals. Blood circulation of the heart. Did we talk about the? We talked about uh, uh, which cir circulation, systemic versus uh, pul pul pulmonic. We know the structures, right? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Structure and function of the heart. Now let's talk, and we know about cardiovascular physiology. How does it actually pump? Who's actually responsible for it? Of course, the brain, the vagus nerve, both parasympathetic and nervous system, uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous innervation. Now, let's look at arteries, veins, and capillaries. And that's chapter 20. Oopsies. Too fast for my own good. So... All of this stuff, uh, it's going to do this to me again. There we go. Where am I? Okay. So we could see here, this is a, let me do this. 
this is another uh, representation of your systemic left-sided. And actually that's what they call it, left-sided, right? So red blood cells do mostly have uh, oxygen. Hence, these are oxygenated. And the right-sided, which is pulmonic, right? And that deals with pulmonary, your lungs. And of course, capillaries are in the middle, which is a wonderful both A and B answer. So this is where the mixing of the oxygen and carbon dioxide occur. What is the difference between an artery and a vein? So if we look at an artery, artery is under a uh, big pressure. So it has a thicker tunica media. And within this tunica media, they have muscles. And the muscles can squeeze. And again, this is autonomic. You cannot control this. You can't tell your arteries, relax. You can't tell your blood pressure, relax. It's not done that way. Your autonomic nervous system, auto means self. So, and the veins, their smooth muscle is very, very thin compared to the huge tunica media, which is a classic question. And I've seen that on NCLEX preps as well. So if you look at an artery, since it has more muscle, it's more round and um, the lumen or the hole is more patent. Meaning to say, as it's round, it looks like a it looks like a tube. But a vein, since it's thin, has less tunica media, less muscles. It's kind of flattened out. Another difference between an artery and the vein is where is it? Where is it? Okay, arteries. You can see how has a lot of smooth muscle versus the veins. Now, the thing about the vein, you see this? Veins have valves, okay? Now, why? The vein is low pressure and the um, artery is high pressure. Now, if it's low pressure, that means the blood may, might have the tendency to backflow, and that's not a good thing. So we have these valves that ensure that the blood only goes in one direction. But if these valves start breaking down, like when you get when you get much, much older, especially people who have had jobs where they stand around all day or they're on their feet all day, which, which by the way, is you future nurses, these valves become incompetent, they break, and you'll get something called varicose veins. Okay. Valves not present in an artery, but present in veins, mostly in your limbs, which are your, um, and here's, here's an example of varicose veins where the valves become incompetent and then they start backflowing the blood and then you get these things called claudications and it starts to hurt. And that's why your grandma wears uh, compression socks. And nowadays runners and CrossFitters, they all wear compression socks. Every time I have the gym, everyone was wearing like, like knee high and thigh high socks uh, because apparently improves in cir it improves circulation. Well, it definitely does for if you're suffering for varicose veins, but I'm not quite sure if it does for when you're, you know, you're young and athletic. Uh, so that is the primary difference. Let me see if there's anything else that we need to know. And we know about the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. So 120 over 80 systolic is typically around 120 millimeters of mercury. And the diastolic, which is uh, uh, your heart, uh, this is your heart pumping through your ventricles. And this is around 80 millimeters of mercury is your diastolic blood pressure, which is your heart when it's filling. And the pressure that's in between is called your pulse pressure. So 120 minus 80, that's around 40. And when it, when it gets bigger and when it gets smaller, there's other pathologies and you'll learn more about that in your medical surgery class. So know that your typical blood pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury, systolic, 80 millimeters of mercury, diastolic, also known as 120 over 80. Your MAP, mean arterial pressure, eh, average blood pressure, but your MAP right here, it's, uh, it, it's more... It, Another term you're gonna hear about that is your um, pulse pressure. 
and you can see here who has uh, um, who has the, um, the 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 more pressure, aorta, arteries, right? Who has the least amount of pressure? Your veins, okay? Because the arteries need to be under high pressure because they're shooting out blood to your systemic. And the veins have to have a lower pressure because they're just coming back in. Who's calling me? Oh, my vehicle's being towed, lovely. Yeah, my car didn't start. I called them like this morning. What time is it, seven o'clock? Beautiful, wonderful timing. Wonderful timing. Okay, the rest of this stuff is med surge stuff. When you learn stuff, I don't, I, I, I don't test you on that stuff. So let's recap. What did we learn? We learned all this stuff about the heart, function, location, structure of the circulatory system, which is the heart and the blood, uh, uh, blood vessels. Um, uh, arteries, veins, and capillaries and their differences. And the capillaries are one cell thick, and that's where the mixing of blood happens. And that's where the gas exchange happens. And I will be putting a, another video, which is called the box diagram, which will help you um, in something called uh, uh, the cardiac cycle. Now, what is the cardiac cycle? The cardiac cycle is a trace of a single drop of blood from your left atrium all throughout the system and back through your lungs and then back ending up in the left atrium. And um, uh, I, I like giving that um, video because for consistency because I start adding and taking away stuff. And I, 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 like the, I like the message to be consistent. So what's due next week? Hold up. Uh, what's due next week is... Uh, do, 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 do. Of course, task six, which is your concept map. Okay, on these four topics. And uh, hey, I'm teaching. Can you tell the, uh, the tow guy to go to uh, Main Street? Hello? Okay. Oh, uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so that's uh, task six. Then for discussion six, they know I'm teaching, I don't understand. Okay, again, look at innovative medical technology regarding your heart, regarding surgery, regarding replacement. And remember, 2021 uh, citations, okay? I, uh, uh, that's an out and out requirement because we are talking about technology. You can watch this video or don't, but your discussion topic is uh, find one innovative idea that's from 2021, Enhances, of course, card cardiology in people's normal lives. It could be medication. It could be hardware. It could be uh, software like apps. What's the latest, greatest thing? And then last but not least. Oh, so dizzy. Lesson six. If you click on Hot Tub Mystery, download the case. Um, questions one through five. Yeah, questions one through five in the first part and questions one through six in the second part. I think that's more than enough for you guys. I don't want you to do all of them. Again, repeat for the lesson, question one through five in the per first part, questions one through six in the second part. All righty, with that being said, um, I'm going to stop the meeting or I mean, uh, stop the recording.